Uh, welcome everybody um, to this online session that highlights the role of rangers in supporting sustainable development around the world. My name is Marianne Kettunen and I'm the head of global program at the Institute for European Environmental Policy, IEEP. And for those in the audience that do not perhaps know IEP, we are an independent, not-for-profit think tank based in Brussels, Belgium and London, UK. And as the name indicates, we work on supporting sustainable environmental policy and decision making in Europe, but also more globally. Little bit background to the event we're having today. So this event is a part of the rollout of a recent publication, a guidance that was published a couple of weeks ago in partnership with key organizations that work in the space of conservation and development, including IUCN, WCPA, the World Bank Group, UNDP, WWF, the Nature Conservancy and Wildlife Conservation Society, WCS, um, and obviously, of course, IEP that's, that I represent. And this guidance demonstrates how area-based conservation can help to deliver sustainable development goals across the world. Um, when I say it is important that we think about project areas and conserve areas in sustainable development goals context, I don't only mean the obvious goals, which are about land and water protection, so the goals that are the number 15 and 14, but what we talk about in this guidance and also in the context of the day is how area-based conservation can really help to support sustainable development through goals which are related to climate change, climate change mitigation adaptation, water provision, also support to sustainable cities and communities around the world, um, to equal societies and also peace and security. So what the guidance highlights and also what the event today highlights is that conservation of our natural, heri natural heritage really supports wider sustainability uh, across the board. And in the guidance that was published a couple of weeks ago, there are many interesting and useful things, we hope, for practitioners and decision makers alike. But perhaps the most interesting thing to highlight is that the guidance has a fleet of 30 real life case studies that clearly show how the existing project and conserved areas around the world are already now delivering SDGs in practice. And to bring us to today's event, one thing that all these case studies have in common is that in all of them, rangers or project area managers, whatever you might call them in a country of question, play a central role in supporting the functioning of these areas and also how these areas support wider well-being. So the way you know we see it and the way things really are is that rangers manage not only habitats and species but they also manage the relationship between nature and the local communities and the relationship between nature and the wider set of users of project areas so that's why they're important and we've heard the term key workers many times during this pandemic um, and very respectfully to apply that term in the context of today and our event I personally cannot emphasize enough how much I think rangers and the ranger community is a key worker community when it comes to ensuring that protected and conserved areas around the world play such a beneficial role as they play in supporting the Agenda 2030. That's you know, the starting point certainly for me and the organizers for this event and what we're here to hear from our participants and panel members is whether they agree and how can we improve the situation that it might be now uh, and support rangers even more in their important work. So IEP is delighted to team up with Thin Green Line Foundation UK for this event, um, an organization that works on the ground with rangers globally. And I'm gonna soon hand over to Abby Getty Irving, who's gonna tell you more about the foundation. But before that, few practical matters on how we're gonna run the event. So we're gonna do an interview style event. Um, we have two round tables. We start by getting concrete insights from our rangers around the world, hearing how their work is taking place on the ground, how they themselves see that they're supporting the sustainability agenda and what kind of support they would need to do so better. And then we move on to reflecting with organizations that work more on the global scale and provide supporting frameworks and also supporting projects on the ground, how we can create and improve even better conditions for the rangers to, to do their important work. And this is really important, perhaps even now more so than ever in the global pandemic, pandemic aftermath or context where we all working on at the moment. 
So we have a fantastic lineup today, I think, with representatives across four continents. So I hope you enjoy listening either this event or the recording afterwards as much as we, I think, enjoy chatting away and sharing our insights. If you have any questions, if you're listening in um, live, um, you can use the QA function, the webinar to ask questions. We will be trying to keep an eye on that and perhaps picking up a few questions while, while we go. And if you wish to share information on the chat function, you can also do that. And finally, just to make you aware, the recording will be, uh, the event will be recorded and the recording will be made available on IP website in the near future so that everybody can use it and circulate. And also those who couldn't join us today because of connection issues or time zones will be able to listen in. So those are few welcoming words and scene setting from my side, but without any further ado, I'm going to now hand over to Abby Getty Irving. Abby is the director of Thin Green Line Foundation UK, and I've asked Abby to kindly provide some information as to what is the Thin Green Line Foundation, and how does it support rangers, and what insights has the work of the foundation provided over the years as to rangers and sustainable development, and that combination of the two. So with that, Abby, welcome over to you. Thank you very much, Marian, and thank you to you and the IEP for organizing today. Um, so why does Thin Green Line need to exist? Well, Thin Green Line was started not because anyone wanted a charity for rangers, but um, out of a pure need um, because nobody else was paying attention. There are organizations doing things on the periphery, but none focused on uh, rangers needs and nobody looking after the families of rangers killed in the field. <clears throat> so it was started in Australia 17 years ago by Sean Wilmore, who you will hear from later. Um, at, a time, at the time, he was a ranger himself, and um, he travelled the world for a documentary um, and was shocked to see how poorly supported uh, rangers were and that there were widows not receiving any support. Um, the International Ranger Federation wanted to help, but had no resources, so Sean raised $5,000 uh, for widows. Um, but not being a charity, the IRF had no means to get that money where it was needed. So um, they told him to set up a charity. Um, Think Green Line uh, UK was set up more recently with exactly the same mission, uh, working along the side Australia, but raising funds and awareness and building partnerships across Europe. Um, just to clarify, uh, whilst the name was set up as UK for administrative reasons, uh, we are really Think Green Line Europe. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, Okay. Right, can everyone see that? We can see it perfectly at least on presentation right. mode, so it yeah. looks great. Great, thank you. So, um, first, uh, um, a simple question, what is a ranger and then what is the need? Well, basically, the men and women on the front line protecting our biosphere every day. Um, before the term ranger was invented, there are many Indigenous people already doing that role as a matter of course. They can be called community rangers or indigenous rangers, protected area workers, but basically they're the ones on the front line of implementation. And in high risk parts of the world, they are more often than not uh, underpaid and poorly equipped um, and insufficiently trained. Um, this affects their ability to protect wildlife and puts their own lives at risk. Um, even the best survey doesn't give the full picture. In our experience, dealing directly with rangers every day, the situation is much worse than any st um, statistics ever show. And we see a chasm building between the theory of change and what is actually happening on the ground. Um, so firstly, um, we have four pillars of support doing the basic things which rangers have told us that they need, and it's what they need as a minimum. The first um, is training. Research has shown that around 40% of rangers in Africa and Asia do not feel adequately trained to do their jobs. Um, this impacts their ability to protect wildlife um, and act in emergencies and support their communities, and it costs rangers lives. Um, uh, collaboration is fundamental to how we work, and we help partners develop bespoke uh, training initiatives, uh, working with the International um, Anti-Poaching Foundation and Ranger Campus on this programme, Lead Ranger. It's a train-the-trainer model uh, that delivers best practice training to rangers in the field, um, developing a network of high caliber local uh, trainers, developing capacity by leaving a legacy uh, of local trainers in situ. Um, female uh, rangers in particular have excelled at this course and we're proud to support the fast growing number of um, rangers who are female. They have a different skill set to men, but say they don't want to be seen separate. They are 
rangers. Um, uh, rangers uh, having first aid training um, helps not only protect the lives of rangers, but of those in their community and lives have already been saved directly from this programme. There are many uh, remote areas where rangers work where communities have no other access to first aid. Uh, the second pillar of support is um, equipment and around 60% of rangers working in Africa and Asia lack the basic equipment to do their job effectively. Boots, mosquito nets, water bottles and so on. And we try to equip rangers with the um, critical kit that they need from the most basic uh, mentioned to vehicles, GPS devices, etc. Um, one current uh, project the UK is working on is getting support to forest rangers in Liberia. Um, can you imagine doing any of our jobs nowadays without any means to communicate with our colleagues? No smartphone, no computer. And now imagine you are in the middle of a forest tracking poachers, trying to prevent, probably in this case, a Western chimpanzee, like the mother of Dini here, being killed and its young being trafficked out of the forest into the pet trade. You're a part of a network of 32 checkpoints, but you have no phone, so you're unable to contact any of your colleagues. Not only have you no chance of stopping that crime, um, no means to record it, uh, your own life is potentially also in danger. This is the uh, current situation there. And with our um, help of our partners, Liberia Chimp Rescue and Protection, we're in the process of getting these rangers equipped with phones. But sadly, this type of situation is common. Uh, our third pillar of support is emergency response. And this is a pillar that would be needed a lot less if uh, the first two were covered. We estimate 80% of rangers and their families have no support if they're injured or killed in the field. And there were 152 recorded ranger deaths last year alone. 82% of rangers in Africa and Asia have faced at least one life-threatening situation at work. And over the past 10 years, over a thousand rangers mm -hmm. have died. Um, despite this, about two thirds of rangers have no form of health or life insurance or workplace pension. Um, our fallen ranger fund provides a financial lifeline to families of those rangers and the equivalent of 2000 US dollars is given to widows or widowers, which equates to roughly a year's salary. Um, this can help cover immediate needs such as children staying in school, housing, um, uh, sometimes the means for a widow or widower to set up a small business to support the family into the future. Um, I think Green Life gave educational support to the young woman on the right here. Her name is Anna Piri from Zambia and her three siblings. Um, the charity supported them after both their range of parents died. Her mother, top left, was killed uh, in the field and her father died of malaria. Um, Anna's now gone through school and university. Um, we also try to support family in community emergencies such as medical expenses and relief in a global crisis such as COVID-19. And in many uh, remote areas during this pandemic, we've heard over and over that it was rangers who were getting vital um, supplies to their communities. This support is not just about equipment and training, it's also equals respect and morale. Um, so uh, our final pillar is about connection and advocacy. Um, this map actually shows the countries where we work, but, um, and I think there may actually be one or two more countries since, since then, but, uh, but anyway, when it comes to advocacy, this relates to rangers anywhere in the world. And we advocate for rangers as nature's protectors um, to be seen as respected uh, conservation influences. Um, it's usually them and their communities who know best what's needed um, on the ground or how it would be possible to fulfill the objectives that those of us uh, in meeting rooms far away are setting. Um, finally, um, we try to connect rangers to each other, uh, sharing skills and knowledge and building the feeling of a supportive worldwide rangers uh, team. But um, there is a huge gulf that we're seeing between theory and practice. We can't do it all and we need everybody joining forces because unless we do, it will still be a drop in the ocean. Might achieve one in 120 aims in some plan because we've not been paying attention to who will be implementing those plans. These are key workers in the protection of the biosphere, climate change mitigation and protection from zoonotic diseases. And this needs to be recognised. So whilst we can talk about how rangers can implement the SDGs, um, how about we flip that around and ask how many times are rangers mentioned in the SDGs? Well, with about 50% of the targets requiring at least an element of nature conservation, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I couldn't find rangers mentioned once. Um, some may argue that community features often, but some of the most powerful outputs from conservation are from community rangers, and uh, the communities want those roles. 
Um, there have been advances and we're excited ranges are being talked about by the big NGOs, but in 182 pages of text in the Convention on Biological Diversity Review, ranges were only mentioned once. Um, the uh, IEEP's paper on area-based conservation recognizes ranges and uh, raises the point that those responsible uh, for fulfilling these goals need to make their case. Um, and that, including, uh, that includes rangers and um, they are spot on on this. Um, we know rangers well, and we have the four pillars of support because that's what they tell us uh, they need. Uh, but we need to feed that back into the SDGs. We need more rangers and we need uh, greater ranger capability. And we need to recognize their key role engaging with their communities because um, who else is going to do that? Um, so this needs to be integral to our discussions and plans. We need to bring the ground to the policy and investing in rangers makes economic sense. Um, as uh, Valerie Hickey from the World Bank mentioned in uh, your launch event actually in our recent range of round table. The jobs with the highest multiplier uh, effect are in nature capital management. Um, the World Bank's own research shows a community ranger in Nepal having an approximately three to one return on every dollar spent. Um, in Kenya, we work with Big Life where one ranger can support up to 24 members of the community with their salary. So Marianne suggested in this intro that I spell out where we need help and what sort of partnerships we're looking to build. Um, across Europe. And so I'm, my challenge is for you to think not what rangers can do for the SDGs, but what can the SDGs do for rangers so that they can implement them? How is it that the key implementers aren't being mentioned? There is a gap. We're not connected and we need to join the dots. Um, you will know the SDGs much better than me, probably by, than any of us at Think Green Line. Uh, we are a conduit between the rangers and those making the decisions, uh, the policies. So this is an invitation to you to come back to us uh, or not just to us, to anybody working with rangers and say, you've got an idea, you want to work together and maybe then we can start to bridge this gap. Um, now enough from me, because it'd be much more interesting to hear from the rangers themselves and uh, thank you to them for giving their time today and again to Marianne and IEP uh, for organizing. Fantastic. Thank you, Abby. That was brilliant and perfect and it's really, Thank you for not shying away from you know stating the obvious, which is that we have this theory, we have the theory of SDGs, not even theory, you know, it, it will work, but you know, unless we really unpick it and find who are the key workers in this space, um, such as rangers, there obviously are many others, but all you know, rangers are the key one, we will not be able to pinpoint where the support should go and you know how we'll actually make this work. And that's also the inspiration behind this event starting from you know, us starting to work on case studies and bringing the evidence base together how conservation supports SDGs and then looking more detailedly into well, actually who's carrying out the work and then you absolutely you end up with rangers being one of the linchpins and connectors in that space and that's what we try to do try to do here with this event also supporting these kinds of connections that you said you know between rangers around the world like a peer network and peer support but also linking them to the people like us at IP or myself who work on policy and to be somehow able to see where the opportunities might be to make sure that you know it starts with them mentioning the right them in the right places these communities and then uh, perhaps you know creating some financial support to that and we're going to talk about that in the second panel hopefully as well you know from the finances perspective how how they cater for this and how they take this hopefully proactively into consideration.